So, yeah, so thanks again for the very kind introduction and for inviting me. So, uh, what I want to do today then is to talk about uh, this polymath project. And the idea is that to understand the question, you don't really need any, almost any pre preliminaries. Uh, so, uh, but and the answer nevertheless is new, uh, was new. And uh, the question was not known until even two years ago or just, just about three years ago, I guess. Uh, I had been asking this question to various people, but I had gotten very few actual answers. And uh, finally, finally, the status was really not known, as I will hope to tell you. Uh, and then three years ago, this uh, got, so I was talking to Terence Stow and he put this problem on his blog and then it got solved in one week. So <laughs> it's, it's a very, uh, what do you call it? Unequi, uh, it's a story of unequal velocities. First nothing happened and then suddenly everything happened, kind of a thing. Very uneven paced, uh, very uneven paced uh, problem, a solution. And so let me just start by uh, discussing a few preliminaries. And then we can go on. So first of all, of course, please feel free to ask questions. Just, you know, I can't see you. So uh, just just uh, you know, unmute your microphone and ask me questions if you have any. This is meant to be a very down to earth talk, very introductory talk. Anyway, the subject is such that there is no, it is the problem is so generally phrased that you can't really use any sophisticated tool. So although it's a question about group theory, I will not use those theorems. Um, I will not use the homomorphism theorems, things like that. So it's very, very basic. Okay, but nevertheless, the mathematics is completely new and it is still very clever, which is which is the idea. The idea is the key, and I want to tell you some of the main ideas. Okay, so uh, let me start by just uh, checking that you know, we're all on the same page. So let's see. So please just let me know if these are all standard things. So first of all, we all know what symmetric space, right? So is this uh, readable first of all? This is legible, right? And video quality is okay. Yes? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, thanks. So yeah, so metric space is just, I will just write it down. It's just a set X with the metric D. And uh, right, and then the, this satisfies three things. D is bigger equal to zero, D is equal uh, and equal to zero if and only if X equals Y. Uh, D is symmetric, so D X Y is D Y X, and uh, the triangle inequality. Okay. What I want to talk about today uh, is metric spaces on groups, metrics on groups. So metrics on a group, metrics on groups. So. So here, what I mean is that G is a group. So there's a, you know, it will usually be a non-abelian group. Uh, I mean, it will be a not necessarily abelian group. And uh, so this is the action, this is the multiplication, this is the inverse. And so first of all, I need the identity and the group. So. Okay, so this is a group. And then I want to talk about a metric. So a metric on a group. So first of all, the group is a set, so you can still talk about x equals g. So there's nothing much to say there. The point what I want to talk about is that the metric on the group is, uh, is uh, let's see. Okay, is the first line still visible right now? Let's see a little more. Is the line visible? Yes, sir. It's the same. Yes, sir. Then, then I'll just address the angle so that I can show more of the board. Ah, so now the point is a metric, let's call it. So of course, the general notion of a metric, there is nothing new. Okay, but uh, but uh, a metric is said to be, let me, so metric uh, D from, now from a group, from G to G. I mean, G cross G to uh, whatever. R, or R bigger equals zero, zero infinity, is left invariant, Left invariant if what happens if it is in, if it doesn't change under left translations. So it means if I have the distance from g times a to g times b, this is left translations, then this is the distance from a to b. 
and this should be true for all G, A, B, N, G. Okay. Now, the point is, uh, so suppose I have a left invariant matrix, right? And similarly, you can define the right invariant matrix, which is the distance from A times G to B times G is distance from A to B. So I won't write that down. But suppose I have a left invariant matrix. Then I can, what can I say about the triangle inequality? So the triangle inequality, uh, so, so say, say, say this is true, so say D from G cross G to R is left invariant. Then let us look at the triangle inequality, okay? So the triangle inequality is the distance from, let's say, x to z, these are all now elements of the group. Okay, less equals distance from x to y plus distance from y to z. So we all know what the triangle inequality states. Let me write these for special cases. So uh, because this is a group, the distance from x to z is really the distance from x times 1 to x times x inverse z. Right? And so this is really the same as the distance from 1 to x inverse z. And similarly here, you can check this is less than or equal to distance from 1 to x inverse y plus distance from 1 to y inverse z. Right? That's what it's saying. Because similarly, I can take x times 1 and x times x inverse y, y times 1 and y times y inverse z. So now, but this is very, so now if you look at it, right, the, given that I have three degrees of freedom, x inverse, x, y, and z, I can make any, I can construct any sort of basis, any, any sort of elements of the group. So if I call this element as g and this element as h, and these can be completely arbitrary. You can think of trying to solve two equations in three, three variables. Then what is this? If you look at g times h, x inverse y, y inverse z, the y and y inverse cancel. This is just g times h. Okay. So the triangle inequality, at least for a left invariant metric, just says can be rephrased as saying for all g and h in the group. So this is only for the left invariant matrix. Okay, this is crucial here. For all G and H in the group, the distance from one, one means the identity element of the group. If you want, you can call it E or you can call it one. I'll just call it one. One to G H is less equals distance from one to G plus distance from one to H. And that's the very simple uh, derivation of that statement for all G and H. That is all that the triangle inequality says if your metric is left in Okay, so that's one thing I wanted to say because we will use this kind of a formulation. So, okay, so now in particular, uh, okay, fine. So, this is one thing, right? Now, uh, for example, if I take g equals h, then you get distance from 1 to g square less equals distance from 1 to g plus distance from 1 to g. So twice distance from 1 to g. Now similarly I can take h equals, sorry I should discuss h equals g. Okay. Now I can similarly take h equals uh, g square. Then what do I get? Then this is g times h, g times g square. So distance from 1 to g cube is less equals, I would get distance from 1 to g plus distance from 1 to g square. But distance from 1 to g square is less than twice this. And this is one more. So now I get three times distance from 1 to g. I know the first line is not visible. I will cut it. Let, let me make a boundary right now. So again, if you have a left invariant metric, then all these things are clear and therefore by induction, you can proceed the same way and 
Okay, fine. I will try to stick between these two lines. This is good, yes. Okay, fine. So this is uh, yeah, this is fine. And so in general, now I can keep doing this. I can just in particular, I can just say the distance from one to g to the n by induction uh, is less than n times the distance from one to g for all n. Let's say for all n bigger than zero or bigger equal to zero. But you can also do this for all n less than zero. Anyway, and that comes from the symmetry assumption. Okay, so what we what I've just told you is you have a first of all a metric and then a metric on the group, then the metric on the group that is left invariant, and whenever it is left invariant, uh, you can do this. You get that this condition holds always by the primary inequality, and therefore you have this condition. Now this should remind you of something. This equation here, the distance from one to g of n is less equal to this thing, should remind you of something. Okay, and that something is just the norm of a vector. If you, I mean, the point is, this is a group written in multiplicative notation, but if I now instead write it in additive notation in our usual way, uh, like think of a Euclidean space, think of Rn, right? So, so for instance, so the group and the plus operation are Rn, sorry, the group and the multiplication operation are Rn with the plus. So you have the origin, you have the negative as the in additive inverse and so on, right? So I'm not even looking at multiplication today. I'll just look at addition, right? In that case, we of course know, uh, has a norm, has a norm, and hence a distance, right? Let me see if I have a better pen. Okay, and hence a distance, right? So the distance between two points, V and W, the two vectors, is simply the norm of V minus W. Right? And now, so what does this equation say? What is the one? The one is really zero. Right? It's the vector zero. And so what this is saying is, let me call this equation star. So the equation star just says that the distance from 1 to g power n. What is the what is g power n now? The nth power in multiplicative notation is just the nth multiple in additive notation. Right? So star says that the, the, what is the distance between two points? The distance is the norm of the difference. So g power n, which is n times v minus 0, is n times v minus c. Right? So, I mean, I have, I have, so far I have really said nothing that is non-trivial. All of this is sort of, you know, undergraduates know all of this, right? Distance, metric, and the distance not. So what this is saying really is just that the, if you rescale a vector, then you get n times the norm. For all n degrees, for all n integers, bigger than zero. But the, notice what is the difference between this and this? The difference is here it was just an inequality by the triangle inequality. And in, in Euclidean space, we actually have an equality because this is an honest to goodness norm, right? So it's a genuine norm and therefore it has a, uh, the norm satisfies this linear scaling property. In fact, the norm satisfies this property for every scalar, right? You can replace n by something like alpha. Uh, and you even have that. Alpha times V norm is no longer this alpha, you have to take absolute value, but then for all alpha in R. And so, so we have something much stronger than this, just this weaker notion, right? Of the triangle inequality for left invariant metric on the group. In this case, the metric or the distance is not just left invariant, it is right invariant as well. I'll just write left in here. Right? But so that is the question. So now the question that I want to talk about today is the following. 
Suppose I have a group on which I have a left invariant metric distance like this, but it is such that this inequality is an equality. So it is what I call a norm on the group. So on a group, you can't take fractional multiples, but you can take uh, integer powers. So, so, so suppose this is an equality for every integer. So now that's, that, that is really the question. So that is the question that I care about. And uh, as I said, it's such a basic question, but nothing was known. Question. See, suppose this thing is equal to, uh, let's say, mod n times the distance from 1 to g for all n, not just bigger equal 0, but for all n integers. Suppose I have a group. I have no restrictions on the group. I just know that the group is such that the distance from the identity to n to the nth power of the nth multiple of an element, of any element, is n times the distance from the identity to 1. This is exactly this statement for whatever scalar multiples you are allowed to take. In a vector space like over real numbers, you can take real vector spaces. If this was a complex c to the n, you could take alpha to be a complex number, alpha and c. For a group, you can't take anything other than integer powers. So we take integer powers. And of course, I should say for all g and g as well. Okay, so suppose this is true for all powers n which are integers and all n which what can you say about the group? Do such things exist? So of course such things exist because we just saw this. This is an example of a. This is an example. So clearly, uh, abelian groups exist. For example, uh, these are in Euclidean spaces. The question is: Do non-abelian groups exist? Can G be non-abelian? Certainly, we can be a median, and the example is on the board. And this satisfies this thing, not just for integer alpha. Uh, Hello? Yeah. Uh, am, am I audible? So, uh, we, shall, we shall think of a finite groups, right? Finite groups. Yeah, so, finite group is not possible. Um, if, you, if we take a finite group, then G power n, like, G power n will be identity for one for some n, and uh, this is turns out to be zero. So the metric itself is uh, like a trivial metric. So in that sense, uh, we we get that equality by uh, this equal this this equality is trivially satisfied, right? Huh, so uh, 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 so I want a non-trivial metric. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think I care about the finite group, but any group with a trivial metric will satisfy this. Yes. Why wait for finite groups? Any group with this metric will always work. So, but the point is this a metric does not cannot be zero except when the finite group for which the metric is trivial is the group which is a single group, right? Because the proper the definition of a metric says if you have two different points, then metric has to be positive. Yes. So then we can't have that, right? So uh, yeah. that is the problem. So yeah, the question is, can G be non-abelian? And the, by the way, of course, the group with one element is, is a bit. So yes. this is an abelian example. So we want to understand, is there a non-abelian example where, of course, the metric is not always zero, so the group is not just a single term, and where this condition is satisfied, and it is left in case. So again, I will assume that it is left in case. So that is the question. Um, okay, And actually, what one can prove is if the group is left invariant and has this property, then it is right invariant as well. Okay, so maybe let me try to prove that for you right now and then I'll get to the slides. So let me write down the lemma. So this is what I will call as a norm on the group. The no, uh, this statement is going to be called a norm. So let me write down. So if the group is left invariant and norm, with no other restrictions, uh, G equals group, if G is left invariant, and not, sorry, if, <laughs> sorry, 
uh, with metric T. D is left if D is left in gradient and not and an on. Just say that again. Then uh, two things. One, let me say G is torsion free. D is right in period. D is also right in period. So yes, if it is left invariant and a norm, then it is also right invariant and G is torsion free. So torsion free comes to the question you asked just now. So proof. So let me first just quickly mention part A. Part A is what is torsion free? Torsion free means that the only element of a finite order is the identity element. Right? So say g to the n is 1, when n is not equal to 0. So the only element which is, so that every every element to the power 0 is 1, because it's like to the power 1 minus 1. And by the way, keep remember, keep remembering that this is just a notation. In abelian groups, this would just be n times. Group is just group with every element under the group operation. Okay, so g to the n is 1 for n not equal to 0 and g in g. And what do you do? You do exactly this thing. So if that is true, now write down this equation. So by the norm equation, so uh, since n is not 0, I can write down the distance from 1 to g. 1 in additive notation would be 0 in multiplicative is 1. This is the distance from 1 to g to the n divided by the distance by, by n, by mod with the modulus of n. That is just from this equation, and I can divide here because n is not zero. But now, since g to the n is one, what is this? This is zero. So zero divided by anything is zero. So distance from one to g is zero. But in any metric space, if two points have distance zero, they have the same point. So that is the torsion free. So the only element for which g to the n is one non-trivially is that g equals one. Okay, so that is one. The part D is, the, of course, the more interesting part. Why is it true that G, the distance which is left in gradient is also right in gradient? And the distance is right in gradient because you can do the following thing. Uh, so to show, uh, let's look at the distance from one to G H G inverse, okay. Now this is so distance is right invariant if okay, maybe I'll say the following. I already know the distance is left invariant, right? so distance is right invariant if and only if what happens if the distance from uh, what was it called A times G to B times G is uh, is the distance from A to B. Okay, but this is if and only for all A, B, and G. This is if and only if the distance from G inverse A G to G inverse B G by left invariance is equal to the distance of this, which is equal to this. Okay. And now I can again do the same thing. I can say I can take A inverse here also. Ah, ah, okay, no, no, no. I, let me not do this. So I'm gonna say this is if and only A. If and only A. The distance of B inverse A. To one b inverse a to one a is equal to how much? It is equal to distance of this over there. So it's g inverse b inverse a g to one. 
Is that clear? I just took this. I pre I pre multiplied both sides by the inverse of this expression. So G inverse B inverse A G, and then this in surface as well. So this is right right, right and maybe if and only this happens without even using that. But you see, this B inverse A is common here and here. And since again I have two degrees of freedom and only one uh, two degrees of freedom, I can I can make this equal any element H. So the real so the right invariant is if and only if. Distance from G inverse H G to one equals distance from H to one. The distance is symmetric, so I can even take the other side for all G and H. So that is really what right invariance means. So I want to prove this. The point is I want to prove this, right? The, the claim is that if the distance is left invariant and a norm, then it is also then it satisfies this condition. Okay, so now let me so now let me do what I started doing, which is consider this. So now consider the distance from one to G inverse H G power n. Okay, I'm going to take n to be a very large integer going to infinity. But for now I just fix an n. On the one hand, this is what the distance from one to g power n to something power n. Because it's a norm, the norm condition now implies this is n times. So this let's say n is bigger than zero, n times the distance from one to g inverse hg. On the one hand, it is this. On the other hand, it is less than what? On the other hand, it is less than. Uh, so one. So please give me one second. I'm sorry. Uh, Sorry, so uh, this is less equals. Uh, huh, now, okay, can anybody tell me what this is? Just the nth power of uh, this thing. So let, me, let me write this in one line so we can continue. But yeah, can you tell me what is the nth power of g inverse a? Okay. That's g inverse h to the power n g. Yeah, g inverse h to the n g. But now this is where I again use my triangle equality. Remember, so on the one hand I have my uh, this is the condition that it's a norm, and now this is just calculating it. But here there is the other condition, the other assumption the group is left, the metric is left in the right? Because of which the triangle inequality is going to distance of one g inverse plus the distance of one to h to the n. That's the distance of one to g, and the distance from one to h to the n is n times the distance from one to a. So what I get is n times something is less than this plus this plus this. Divide both sides by n and take n goes to infinity. What do you get? The two terms where there is no n on the right hand side, you just go to zero. So if I take divide by n and divide the whole thing by n, you get one over n times something and n goes to infinity, that goes to zero. One over n times this thing, n goes to infinity. So all you get is this middle term is all that matters. So divide by n. Let n go to infinity. What you get, you get is that the distance from 1 to g inverse hg is less equal to the distance from 1 to h. And you know this is true for all g and h in the loop. This is just using these two basic properties and nothing more. And that is the flavor of the mathematics we are going to see. We will use extremely basic definitions of properties, nothing more, because the group is completely arbitrary. So we have no other structure or results 
In fact, we know the group is never finite because the only torsion element is the identity. So you can't use Silo's theorem, you can't use any fancy classification theorem for groups or something. Nothing. We have to use just the basic information given to us, which is a metric, which is both left invariant, so you get something like this, and the norm, so you can always scale. Okay, but now you have so, but already that gives you that the distance is less equal to this. If I could also obtain this, this, this inequality, then I would exactly get the first time. If I could obtain this inequality, the reverse, way, then I would get the first time. But the point is, I can obtain this inequality, right? Because <laughs> let me call H prime as Z inverse H D, and then H actually equals G H G inverse. G H can be. And so again, because all this is saying is the distance from 1 to h beats the distance to any conjugate. Well, but now the reverse holds because I can call this as h prime and then this is a conjugate of h. Look, here it is. And that's why this reverse inequality also holds. And therefore I get equality here. And that's why my metric, which is left invariant and the norm, is right invariant. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so with uh, so, so, so now the question really is: Suppose I have a left invariant metric on the group, and therefore a right, which is a norm, and hence also right invariant. Can that? So, first of all, I already know, as I proved for you, that that group must be torsion-free. Okay? Uh, can that group be? Must that group be abelian, or do there exist non-abelian examples? The reason why I ask about the uh, must it be non-abelian, and the reason why I mentioned torsion-free is because you can prove the converse. If you have any abelian and torsion-free group, so both, the torsion-free is important. If you have any abelian and torsion-free group, you can put a norm on it. Meaning, you can check that that group sits inside a Banach space, a vector space like Rn. Okay? It can sit inside that. It must sit inside that by Zorn's lemma. And therefore, it has a norm on it. And, the, and it sits additively. Therefore, the norm on, that's the norm on the group. The question is, is the converse true? If I have a norm on the group, uh, which has the left invariant metric, uh, then necessarily the group is torsion free. Must it also be a lead? And therefore, must it come from a Banach space? So that is the question we will try to answer in this, in this talk. Okay, so now with this preliminaries, uh, I think I can go to the talk. Yeah, so let me now go to the slides. Okay, it is... Uh, so it's a very 21st century story in the sense that uh, uh, the whole thing happened with tools that were not even available in the 20th century. So I, of course, originally it happened because I was there and I had been exploring some question and probability. I came to this question, can there exist non-abelian groups with a norm and a left invariant metric? But then I emailed various people, nobody had an answer that, I, that was known. So I went to, uh, I, I had gone to meet Tao for a different collaboration and then eventually he put up this question on a blog and his blog is very much followed, uh, you know, but I think even his blog wasn't around in the 20th century. So uh, the blog is what, what made it work. Also, the entire discovery and the progress on this problem was made in the comment section on his blog. So all that is a mode of mathematics collaboration and research that was really, it's really very new. And finally, when all sort of uh, human intuition kind of broke down, uh, one of my colleagues in IISA, Siddharth Gadgil, he uh, wrote some computer programs and made the computer do some work and that provided the next step in the breakthrough. So again, something which is very, very modern. So this is an example of very modern mathematics, which uh, you know, answers a very, very basic question, which is completely, you know, undergraduates can understand the question. There's a norm, there's a group with a norm and is it non-abelian or is it abelian and yet this was not known until recently and it was solved in a very modern way and by people who have as you can see i mentioned six five names here and myself most of the pairs of these people have never met each other but uh, but uh, yeah but it was solved by people working all around the world and uh, now by now the paper is on the archive and it is published uh, in algebra and number theory so uh, here is the story of that that uh, problem. So uh, group. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You, you said about which was the block? Just to, 
Yeah. You search for Terence Tao blog on Google, you will find it. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you some screenshots from the blog in the, during the course of this talk. But yeah, you should be able to find it by searching for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Uh, and if you want a precise link to that blog, then you go to my to the blog about this paper. Then you go to my website. I mentioned the link to Tao's blog. And the first, so he blogged two or three or four okay, times, problem, which updates on the progress. But yeah, the first link is there. Okay, so uh, yeah, so let's then let's begin. So suppose G is a group, as I said, with this is I didn't write down the inverse, but fine. And it's a group with a translation invariant metric. When is this metric a norm? And by norm, I just mean the distance from one to the nth power, which is just like the distance from zero to the multiple. Of the group element is equal to the uh, n times the distance from one to g. Okay. Example. <laughs> the example. The prototypical example is any Euclidean space, and then the distance is the Euclidean norm. But in fact, any LP norm will also work. So more general than Euclidean spaces, you can think about Banach spaces, right? Like uh, LP spaces on measure spaces or things like that. Any LP norm on Euclidean space. Any function on Banach. Ah, here we go. So take any Banach space that itself is a group with a translation invariant metric, and therefore you can say instead of taking the full Banach space, I can take any subgroup of a Banach space, and then of course that also inherits the norm from the Banach space. Therefore, it is scaling invariant by integers. Right? It may not be scaling invariant by real numbers because it's just an additive subgroup, but it is certainly closed under integer multiples because it's a subgroup. And so any such thing has a uh, yeah now uh, has a norm has a translation invariant metric and a norm okay so now the question is uh, uh, what about so okay this is fine note that then any such subgroup is abelian and torsion free uh, we already talked about that right that only multi only elements non-trivial elements whose multiples are uh, Trivial are the, whose non-trivial multiples are the identity or the zero element or the uh, zero element itself. The converse is the more interesting thing. I will explain it shortly. As I think I said over there, if G is abelian and torsion-free, then you can actually put a norm on it, meaning you can embed it into a Banach space with a norm. So the question now remains: If you have an so torsion, you have to be torsion-free anyway, so that is fine. If you are abelian, you can put a norm on it. What if you are non-abelian? And there was no okay. I should correct this to from to date. There was no example known before this paper was written. This is the precise statement. But also there was no count. There was no negative result known that you know no such groups have to be abelian. Non-abelian groups cannot exist. That was not known either. So which way does it go? Do there exist such groups or not? So this, yeah. So this is in the talk. I mean, very quickly, I will tell you the answer in like three slides more. Uh, but let me tell you first why I came to the question. So I came to the question from sort of probability theory, and uh, then this slide and the next slide are sort of a little technical. You don't need to worry too much about it. But I'll try to give you some introduction, basic, uh, not overview, but something like an overview. So, okay, before I talk, has everybody seen Banach spaces? Okay, maybe I should say then if you so if you don't know what the Banach space is, then think of Banach space as Euclidean space. Okay, R n, but R n with a possibly L p norm. So it's not a Pythagorean theorem kind of norm, but it is a norm. So it is scaling invariant. It satisfies the triangle inequality. Norm x plus y less than norm x plus norm y, and so on. Okay, so that's roughly what a Banach space is. But the point is Banach spaces can also be infinite dimensional. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so let me go back to full screen. So, so if you have seen probability theory like Gaussian or Gaussian normal random variables or binomial random variables, these are variables that take values on a sigma algebra, like you know, events, if you will, uh, but then become a real value, right? The output is some. Uh, the output is, uh, of course, uh, actually no. These are just variables which uh, take inputs as real numbers and give outputs as real numbers. Like the binomial on zero, one, two, and three would be one over eight, three over eight, three over eight, and uh, sorry, no, something. I'm saying it wrongly. It takes values in a sigma algebra and it takes output values in 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 real numbers. Fine. Yeah, that's what it does. 
right? Uh, and similarly, the Gaussian random variable, uh, of course, is supported on the real line, exponentially supported on zero infinity, things like that. But then what people were looking at were random variables that take values in a sigma algebra and the outputs of those random variables lie in a in vector space like you know multi you can talk about multivariate normal and you can talk about the values take random variables taking values in a vector space like a banach space like euclidean space with lp norm instead of this right in general they can even take values in any set or any metric space as long as you can do some kind of measurability uh, compatibility so one of the cornerstones, one of the big achievements of 20th century probability theory is before that you have seen things like De Moivre's uh, Laplace central limit theorem or Gaussian density and so on, which were more real, va real valued random variables. But in the 20th century, after Kolmogorov laid down the foundations and axioms, then people went to try to understand vector valued random variables, multivariate normals, Wishart distributions and even more general. And one of the sort of, uh, what do you call it, one of the pinnacles of this field maybe is, is really Banach space random variable theory. And one of the jewels of the crown jewels of the 20th century probability is this book, is this comprehensive big book by uh, Ledoux and Tanagram, okay? which talks about uh, probability beyond uh, just usual Rn or even R value random variable. But you can even go beyond Banach spaces. And so you can talk about things like probably random variables taking values in permutation groups, like random permutations. You may have seen this under the other name. If you have, some of you may have seen uh, a professor at Stanford called Percy Diaconis, and he does things on like card shuffling. And if you may have seen this result that if you take a deck of cards and you shuffle it to the one card, one card, one card, one card from either side, it's called riffle shuffles. So if you riffle shuffle it seven times, then it is almost random. It's very, very well mixed. So that is well, a shuffle is just a permutation in the group of in the permutation group on twenty on fifty-two letters on the fifty-two cards. Right. So, but it's talking about probability. Randomness is really some kind of with high probability. It is something, some property. So that's really permit random permutations. It's permutation groups valued for random variables. You can talk about other things. So this Professor Parthasarathy in ISI Delhi. Uh, he has a book on metric spaces, uh, probability with random variables taking values in metric spaces. You can talk about random variables taking values in groups or Lie groups or manifolds and so on. So there are all kinds of settings beyond even this 20th century probability theory where you go beyond Banach spaces, beyond vector spaces even, and look at probability or random variables taking values in more general structures. Okay. And so I was, I was, I, was working with somebody else. I was at Stanford at the time. We were working in the stat department faculty and I were working on understanding some probability theory results, some inequalities in a common way. Okay, And so the common way means that it should be in a setting that includes both Banach spaces and Euclidean spaces and real numbers and complex numbers, but also permutation groups, also Lie groups and all these kind of things. Okay? So it should include it in a common way, which means if you're trying to work over random variables being that general, then that is the, the, the disadvantage, if you will, or at the same time, the power of the mathematics is that you have much less tools to work with. You can't do anything. Like you can't use any sophisticated results about Euclidean space, like finite dimensionality, because I don't, I, I might be wanting to work outside finite dimensional spaces. So, for example, what is, so that is what I'm saying when I say primitive framework. You want to work in a primitive framework where you can only use very, very basic axioms, just very few definitions, and really no more deeper results. And yet, how far can you go? How far can you push the probability results? That was the question. So, uh, here are some examples of primitive frameworks. Uh, you might have seen, well, everybody has seen Pythagoras' theorem. It says that if you have two things which are perpendicular, then their norm squares add up to the square of the norm of their sum. Right? <clears throat> so sum of squares of norm is norm of sum of squares. Sorry, the norm square of sum. Yeah. But the point is, this is not just true in R2. We only have seen Pythagoras theorem in school in the plane. Right? You have two vectors in the plane. This is true in every Hilbert space. Okay? You write down that x plus y norm square is the inner product of x plus y comma x plus y which is you write x bracket x plus y bracket y plus the cross terms, but the cross terms are zero, 
because of the perpendicularity and therefore you get x bracket x plus y bracket y so you don't need to use uh, rn or r2 it's true in every hilbert space in every inner product space similarly in algebra it's even more basic if you look at this inequality this equation a plus b square is a square plus a b plus b a so i don't write 2 a b plus b square then this works in any ring not commutative but any ring not unital, not commutative. This is always true. Even more basic, if I look at 1 minus 1 is 0, then I don't even need, th this is not necessary to be used those real numbers. I can work in any group. What this is really saying is G times G inverse is the identity. And that works in any group. So, is it clear what I mean by primitive framework? I mean that you can write down this equation and although you might have seen this equation over real numbers, actually this equation is just saying g times g inverse is e. And that is true over far, far more settings than just real numbers. It's true over permutation groups. It's true over z mod 5z, like you know, cyclic groups. It's true over any group and not even abelian groups. So that is what I mean by primitive framework. It should be broad enough to encompass lots and lots of different settings, not just the ones we are traditionally used to working in. And in probability now, coming to probability, here is a uh, primitive example of a primitive framework. If you have, this is again, if you have seen probability, if not, then don't worry about this slide and the next. If xn goes to x almost surely, or almost everywhere uh, in measure, in random, so yeah, uh, this is xn and x are a sequence of random variables, then xn converges to xn probability. Now to state this result, you only require the notion of a distance function, because what does convergence mean? And so you can state this result for x and x taking values in the metric space. Now let's say separable metric space so that uh, I'll just check the time. Huh? So, yeah. The remarkable thing is you can prove it in this generality as well. To state a result or to ask whether a result holds in a general setting is very, very different from trying to prove the result in that setting. Maybe in the proof you require some extra assumptions. Remarkably, for this particular statement probability, you don't need any extra assumptions. Similarly, just like here, you see a plus b square is a square plus 2ab plus b square or a square plus ab plus b a plus b square. I don't need to work over real numbers for this. I can work over matrices. If I have two matrices, a and b, which are both square of the same size, then a plus b square is equal to all of this. And these are matrices over any field or even any commutative ring. And I don't need to work over real numbers for this. So you see, you can state a formula like this, but you can also prove it. And that is the real, the real point of it. Can you prove formulas in the general setting? And we were trying to do that with probability inequalities. So something like this. So what we were studying is sums of independent random variables. Not difference, but sums. Okay. And for well, why that, that's how modern probability is now. You don't use exact convergence results like strong law of large numbers or weak law or normal central limit theorem. You try to prove some kind of estimates on the tail behavior. Anyway, whatever that is, the key is that you want to talk about convergence and sums of independent variables. And for sums, you just need to perform addition or not even addition. You don't need the fact that you, I want to sum them in a particular order. So I don't want addition to be commutative. So really multiplication in the group. But you see, I don't even need the inverse. I don't even need the identity. I just need to multiply two elements in the group. There is a structure called a semi-group which is not a group, which is weaker than the group in which that happens. So, for example, to give you an example, if you look at the positive integers, then you can certainly add two positive integers. But you cannot invert because there is zero is not a positive integer and negative numbers are not positive integers. So, you can always add, but you can you don't necessarily are able to subtract or even get zero. Right? So, that's what a semi-group is. It just is closed under addition. So what we therefore did was we worked over arbitrary semi-groups and a translation invariant metric, meaning left invariant and right invariant. I told you what that means. And these are the primitive settings that include both the Euclidean spaces from traditional modern probability theory, but then also things that go beyond it, like groups and compact groups and so on. And so, on. And so in a paper with Bala Rajaratnam, he was a professor of statistics in Stanford, we showed some such inequality and it holds over any metric setting. Yeah. Fine. So there was some result in over real numbers that was well known. We extended it to beyond metric sp vector spaces to all kinds of groups and semi-groups and so on. And we proved there that this result holds in all this generality. 
because you don't need any more to state the result so why should you need any more to prove the result so we really identified the best possible case but similarly there was a 2016 paper in which we had studied another such result and in the course of that and this is the thing that you have to take it, take away from this slide or the last slide in this one every abelian normed group so i told you what a normed group is a group is a norm every abelian group like that does sit inside a smallest banach space so if the group is abelian yes it can be embedded inside a banach space okay, and i will tell you how and this is very nice because it extends things like you know functional analysis to groups usually we are used to of course you know looking at functional analysis over banach spaces but because this group sits inside the banach space you can talk about functionals on the group itself and so because we looked at that paper in 2016 we had this thing that every non every abelian norm group sits inside a banach space on the other hand the 2017 paper said if you don't even have a group but if you just have a metric semi group i can prove various inequalities that hold in real numbers in that generality so the natural question is i know that i can prove some abelian group thing here i can prove some results in this generality now like functional analysis some results there or some bochner integration what about non abelian norm groups if i know that the group is non abelian i know it's a group so it's stronger than this and i also know it is not which is a very strong condition then can you prove some other results that are there there are natural results like can you extend this kinchin kahan inequality from abelian groups to non abelian groups which are not so with that motivation i was trying to understand can one prove things like this inequality over non abelian norm groups and i got nowhere there was no progress made so i said okay let me not you know like try to prove it in this complete generality the maybe for at least for me what works uh, the most fundamental thing to do the easiest thing to do the first thing to do is to look at an example right try n equals 1 try n equals 2 try simple examples and if i can prove that such an inequality holds skinchin kahan holds which held over abelian metric groups can it if it holds over a non abelian metric group norm group a specific example of such a group then maybe i can understand what techniques to try and use in the general case so i said let me try to look for some example of a non abelian norm metric group on which i will try to prove this remarkably i could find no examples and that was what i said in the very first slide right non abelian groups with a norm no example known to date and that's why i started writing to people you know like okay we all know norm abelian groups like banach spaces and euclidean space is there can you give me an example of a non abelian group which is not and for 3 years well not for 2 years i guess <coughs> yeah from early 2016 to late 2017 for 2 years i wrote to a bunch of people i wrote to people in india in the us in europe and nobody was able to give me any examples and nobody was able to tell me that these things don't exist maybe they do maybe they don't but what is known pretty much nothing was known and this is a very very simple thing to ask right a little combination of algebra non abelian group and analysis a norm and i mean there are clearly abelian groups like banach spaces and euclidean spaces so why not non abelian groups somehow this was not known what was known but not this is not the full strength quest answer is there are non abelian groups with metrics and so you can talk about distance function even if these are not scalable like a norm and these occur in geometry so you know in kind of geometric group theory you have things called free groups and monoids and word matrix so um free groups are just groups of strings of letters i'll i'll define and give you examples of that on a slide later there are also some things called riemannian matrix on the lie group and there are even left invariant riemannian matrix and i think i wrote down the definition for you earlier the symbols may be interchanged then there are translation invariant meaning left and right invariant matrix on compact lie groups okay so the distance from g to h equals the distance from left multiply by a and right multiply by b both sides and that does not change the distance for all a b lie okay so uh, in this setting one doesn't call a norm but one calls it a length function so i just want to give you the commonly used terms right so in in the geometric group theory we call it a length function <coughs> sorry a length function on the monoid 
or a group. A monoid is just something where you don't have uh, inverses, but you do have the identity function. So G is a length function from G to zero infinity such that the length is subadditive. This should remind you of the triangle inequality. The length is bigger than zero if G is not equal to one and equal to zero at one. This should again remind you of the metric. And the length is equal to length of G inverse if G is a group. So the first two for a monoid and the, all the three conditions for a group. Okay. Now the point is length functions are exactly the same as left invariant metrics on groups. So why? Because if you look at the distance, let, let's define, uh, so suppose I have given a left invariant metric, left invariant, not right invariant. And I look at the distance from one to G and I call that the length of G. Then what is the second condition saying? It's saying the distance from one to G is positive if G is not one. And the distance from one to one is zero. That's exactly what a metric does, right? And similarly, the second condition sort of, the third condition is like saying the distance from one to G is the distance from G to one. The metric is symmetric. The third, the first condition is really just the triangle inequality. The distance from one to GH is less than the distance from one to G. That's the distance from one to H, as I just derived for you on the board, right? So, uh, so that means that if you are given a distance function, you can talk about the corresponding length function. The bijection is that it's true the other way as well. If you are given a length function, I can tell you the one, one variable, sorry, the left invariant distance function, and that is defined in this formula. The distance between G and H is defined to be the length of H inverse G. So if you look at AG and AH, you get H inverse, A inverse, A, G. And the A inverse and A in the middle cancel, and you just get length of H inverse G. Right? So that's why the distance induced from such a length function is indeed left in the And this is, a, this is literally the exact dictionary, which means that if I ask you for a question that I was asking, do there exist left invariant norms on the group? That's the same in geometry under a different, just a different dictionary as asking, do there exist length functions on the group which satisfy the norm condition? So what is the norm condition? The norm condition is called homogeneous. The length of g to the n, the distance from 1 to g to the n, is n times the distance from 1 to g. So this is the non-abelian or geometric version of a norm. And so the question therefore is, can the length function, if g is a non-abelian group, sometimes it does admit a length function, but does the length fun can the length function be homogeneous? Are there non-abelian groups with homogeneous length functions? Uh, there are some results that, so, so now once you go to geometry, then some geometers were able to tell me this, some partial answers. W what Milner proved, uh, one of the leading geometers in the world, he proved 40, 50 years ago that if G is a connected Lie group and not a billion, then no such norm exists. I will even tell you a little bit about this on the future slide for those who sort of know Lie groups. If not, then don't worry about it. If G is nilpotent of order two, one can prove, and this calculation was carried out by Tao on his blog, that uh, this commutator is the same as this commutator. So the nth squared power of this commutator is this. Why does this prove that the norm cannot exist? Oh, sorry, uh, I should remind you that the commutator of two elements in the group is G H, G inverse H inverse. So before I tell you why this cannot exist, just think for a minute, when does this left-hand side or the right-hand side equal the identity? What is the condition on G and H for which this equals the identity? Can anyone tell me? Sort of solve the equation, if you will. Yeah. When they commute. When they commute, right? So what you have to do is multiply uh, on the right hand side. So post multiply this equal to E. Post multiply by H times G. Then this H times G cancels this because first the H inverse and H cancel, then the G inverse and G cancel. So you get G H on the left and identity times hg on the right. So gh equals hg. So this equals the identity precisely when, if and only if, g and h commute. That's why it's called the commutator, right? So now let us consider this equation. This is true whenever g is an important of order 2. It is not true in general groups. But whenever it is, this is true. That's basically because commutators are central. Anyway, I'm glad to explain that later. Um, but now suppose I did have such an important group of order two to possess a length function, a homogeneous length function, then take lengths on both sides. What do you get? Well, you get n square times the length of gh on the left hand side, right? Because that's the whole point of a length function. 
n square times something is equal to the length of this. And what is the, what is the commutator itself? It is g to the n, h to the n, g to the minus n, h to the minus n. So there are four n terms. There are four n terms on this side, which means that if I take the max of the lengths of g, a, g inverse, h inverse, then the length of this side is less than four n times the max of those lengths. So it is some four n times a constant. Right? <clears throat> so the growth of the right hand side is less than four n times a constant. It's a linear growth. The growth on the left hand side is n square times the length of this. It is quadratic growth. How can the quantity that is growing linearly equal a quantity or be bound? Sorry, how can a quantity that's growing quadratically be bounded above less equals a quantity that's growing linearly, the length on the right hand side? That cannot happen unless the left hand side is also growing linearly or slower. But this is n square times something. That means the length of that something must be zero. If the length of something is zero, that means that this something is one. And as you just said, the commutator is one if and only if g and h commute. So again, if you prove that the length is zero in the nilpotent group, then somehow you get uh, abelian again. You get commuting elements. So we are not getting non-commuting elements. So what Milner proved was in certain cases, this cannot happen for a non-abelian group. What somebody else, like Stau, essentially proved on this blog during our discussions is that this cannot happen for nilpotent groups because every nilpotent group would contain a subgroup of order two, but that cannot happen. On the other hand, um, I was talking to a different geometer in New York University, and he told me that if G is a free monoid, monoid is where you don't have inverses. Then such a norm always exists, always exists. So you know, on the one hand, we have two examples of non-abelian, nilpotent, or uh, connectedly groups where this norm cannot exist. On the other hand, a free monoid, in that case, it always exists in every single time. So the question remains, what happens for general groups? Or at least, do such non-abelian groups even exist? And that is the, uh, that's the main result then. So let me, so now, yeah, the main result of the talk is uh, that, in fact, it doesn't. So given any group, the following are equivalent. An abelian and torsion-free group, that's a condition from algebra. G is abelian and G is torsion-free. If and only if G is a metric. So this, there is no talk of a metric on this group here. There is nothing about a metric in statement one. There is nothing about abelian or torsion-free in statement two. Analysis, G is a metric space, it's a group. So I'm always given it's a group with no further restrictions. G is a group with a metric space that admits a norm, which is a bi-invariant metric that satisfies uh, this condition, the norm condition. Geometry, G admits a length function. Length function, remember, corresponds not to bi-invariant metrics, but only to left-invariant metrics. Okay, And it also, I wanted to say it's a norm, meaning this holds for all n. Here, I just wanted to hold for n equals 2, for one integer, not for all n. So much weaker. This is stronger. So 2 implies 3 is clear, because if it's, tra it's translation invariant, which is left invariant and right invariant, but left invariant means you can just call it L. You can translate the language, the dictionary to a length function. And if this is true for all N, then it's true for N equals two. Therefore you get this statement. The claim is this much is enough to imply the backward implication as well. So a condition from algebra, a condition from analysis, a condition from geometry, and maybe two implies three, but the rest of them are not at all clear. These are all equivalent. And they are equivalent further to the fact that G embeds isometrically and additively in a Banach space. So these are the four conditions and they are all equivalent. And maybe you have seen this uh, quotation by Herman Weil in the early 20th century that in these days, meaning 100 years back, the angel of topology and the devil of abstract algebra fight for the soul of every individual discipline of mathematics. So, I mean, what I think he meant to say is algebra is very dry. It doesn't provide you any intuition. It's exact formulas. You do some calculations. But topology and geometry you usually visualize closed sets, open sets, and so on. So that's really very natural. And algebra is completely in the mind. Anyway, but the moral of the story is sometimes these things are all one and the same. You may think these are fighting among themselves, but they really are one and the same in this case. So, for example, if you like analysis, then here is a completely analysis based, a metric space version, a metric space definition almost, or if and only if, of an abelian and torsion free group. 
I mean, this has nothing to do with abhidin and torsion free a priori, but this is equivalent to it. It's a phenomenon. If you like geometry, well, a group with a homogeneous length function, you can just call it an abelian and torsion free group. And again, that has nothing to do with length functions or homogeneity, but guess what? It does. And so on. So mathematics really, this is really the thing about unity of mathematics. All these things are connected and in completely unexpected ways. As I said, you know, until three years ago, this was nothing was known. Anyway, so let me now, the rest of the talk, I want to try to sketch some of the proofs for it. So clearly, for if G embeds in a, nice, in a Banach space, of course, it's a subgroup of a Banach space, it is automatically abelian and torsion free. We already said that. And uh, if it embeds in the Banach space, it is indeed a metric subspace that admits a norm because the norm inherited from the Banach space. Two plus three is obvious. So let me first tell you why any abelian torsion free group does sit inside the Banach space with no restrictions, just abelian and torsion free group. <coughs> I will use Zorn's lemma. Then uh, I will tell you why uh, if L is too homogeneous, 3 implies 2. So if first of all, I already proved for you that, sorry, I will next show that if it is too homogeneous like this, then it is homogeneous like this. It's a norm. But then as I worked out on the blackboard, if it is a left invariant distance function, meaning a length function, and it is a norm, then it must be right invariant as well. And so you get the full statement of 2. Okay, so that I already worked out for you. And the final highly non-trivial part is why is 2 implying 1. So suppose I do have a left and right invariant metric on the group, which is also a norm, why does that make the group abelian? The group is torsion free also, I worked out clearly for you just now. So why is it abelian? Okay, so why is 1 imply 4? Meaning look at the title. Why is every abelian torsion free group embeddable into a Banach space? So the construction is sort of with very standard tools again, uh, but I'll just, you know, I'll, I won't maybe explain this, I can explain it later. If G is abelian and torsion free, it is a subgroup of this so, first of all, what does that mean? It means abelian. So, it's a Z module. It's a module over the integers. Then I can do some kind of a base change. I can take the tensor product with R. And if it's abelian and torsion free, then G actually embeds. Nothing gets killed when you take the tensor product. G embeds inside G tensor R over the integers. The point is, this is a vector space. And every, so now, the, now, now is where Zorn's lemma comes in. Uh, has everyone seen Zorn's lemma, by the way? or axiom of choice or something. Sorry, hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you, have you seen? Yeah. Yes, sir, yeah. yes. So people have seen John or axiom of choice. Like yeah, every vector yeah. space has a basis. Right. Yeah, yes. So, uh, so by John's lemma, I can tell you that every vector space has a norm. Every vector space over the real numbers has a norm. How? Well, for example, I, I write down the base, I fix a basis which exists by Zorn's lemma. That's where, that's the only place where I need the Zorn's lemma to construct a basis. Now take, uh, let's say I give every vector of this basis norm one. Now take any vector in the vector space. It is a linear combination of the basis summation CI, VI. Well, give the vector the L1 norm, which means it is summation modulus of CI. That's a norm. The claim is this is a norm on the vector space. So you can, that, that's very easy to check. So every vector space has a norm. Over real numbers has a norm. So in particular, this vector space has a norm. Yes, yeah, sir. Just to make sure. Yeah. Hamel basis just means a normal basis, right? It's, normal Usually. Basis, yeah. it's just, I think the okay. name historically was to call it a Hamel basis. It's just a basis of okay. this over R, not over Q. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so this vector space has a norm. But now, if it has a norm, then every sub subset has a norm as well. So consider this Q vector subspace. And this is just a set of discrete or whatever, non discrete points, but dense points, nowhere, sorry, dense and nowhere dense or whatever. Sorry, dense and the complement is dense kind of points. This is a Q vector space for the same reason that this is an R vector space, because this is abelian and torsion free. Okay. So this is a vector subspace, but over Q, over rational numbers with a norm on it. And now you do something called the Cauchy completion of this vector space under the given metric. Okay, and that you can do. That is always possible. Huh. So the point is, if even so, the, the key is the following. Why am I have to do all this? Why, why do I first take tensor over R, then restrict to the tensor over Q, then complete Q? Because, for example, if G is supposed to the integers, 
then that is fine. You get the real numbers, you get the rational numbers, and when you Cauchy complete the rational numbers, we all know you get the real numbers. That is great. But suppose G itself is the real numbers, then R tensor R over here is an enormous vector space. It is extremely large. It is an uncountable dimensional vector space. R, if G is R, then this is not R itself. This is a huge vector space. So you take the norm from this vector space, and now, but once you go to G tensor Q, R tensor Q, that goes back to one dimension. R tensor Q is one dimensional, R tensor R is infinite dimensional. So because of that, you can't just work with R tensor R and the norm. That will not give you a norm of the original group. But now what you can say is, yes, come down here. And uh, so, okay, that will, that will give you a very big vector space containing R maybe. But what I want to construct here, I'm constructing here the very smallest vector space that contains the group G. And so for instance, here I get R tensor R, when I, R tensor Q, which is R. When I Cauchy complete it, I still get R. And so I'm done. I get R containing R. Not containing some enormous unnatural vector space, but containing itself with the norm. Okay, so the same way now here, uh, when you take the Cauchy completion and define some usual things, you can check that this is indeed the smallest Banach space containing this set and therefore containing this group. So we use Zorn's lemma to go first to a very, very big space, but then come down to the smallest Banach space that contains a given abelian and torsion free group. See, here there is no mention of a norm, it is abelian and torsion free. But the moment it sits inside a real vector space, Zorn's lemma gives us the norm. And therefore, the norm applies to G. So therefore, G has a norm. It sits inside the Banach space. So that's why 1 implies 4. It's not a very long proof. You have to just remember a few standard things that you have to do. OK, now what about 3 implies 2? So yeah, so we are showing I, I, the goal of this talk, as I said, is to prove everything. So we already said 4 implies 1. And now I told you why 1 implies 4. So 1 and 4 are equivalent. Great. Now, I've told you 4 implies 2 is just trivial and 2 implies 3 is trivial. So now I'm going to prove that 3 implies 2 and then 2 implies 1, not 2 implies 4, but 2 implies 1 and 1 implies 4. So then everything implies everything else. So why does 3 imply 2? Okay, so 3 says that G admits a length function, which is not homogeneous, but which is too homogeneous. 2 implies that G, is, uh, G admits a homogeneous length function and is also right in Okay, so suppose D L is a length function which is too homogeneous, which means length of G square is twice length of G. But then you see, if I put in G square in place of G here, I get length of G to the fourth, G square square. And that must be twice length of G square, which is by here, four times length of G. And so I can keep going. Right? So I can loop length of G to the eighth, which is length of G fourth square, which is twice of length of G fourth which is 2 times 4 times length of g, and so on and so forth. So I can do for every power of 2, I can prove by induction on the power that the length of g to the 2 to the n is 2 to the n times length of g. Okay, I hope that is clear. The question really is, what about the other powers? I want to prove that this equals the length of g times 6. But how do I do that? Right? So here is how we do that. Uh, you take a power of 2 that's bigger than 6. Let's take g to the 8. So what I get is length of g to the 8 on the one hand is equal to 8 times length of g, right? That is just by the previous, uh, by the two homogeneities. But g to the 8 is equal to g to the 6 times g times g. So by the triangle inequality or the sub-additivity of the length function, Length of a product is less than the sum of the lengths. So I write down length of g to the 6 plus then g to the g. Now I can again use the triangle inequality 6 times and I get length of g to the 6 is less than 6 times length of g plus 1 plus 1. And guess what? If I add these terms again, I get 8 times length of g. So I started with 8 length of g and I end up with 8 length of g. Which means every inequality in between must be an equality. And I want to look at the last equal inequality. This is an equality. Cancel the length of g times 2, and you get exactly what you want. You get an equality. And this is true for length of g to the 6, but of course, it's the same true for any positive length. And because for negative length, negative positive power, but for negative powers, the length is the same as the length of positive power, so we are done. Yeah. 
so I hope is this clear that the length of G is uh, if I know that the length of G square is length of twice length of G then from that alone I can deduce this for every power of G every integer power of G okay so that implies this thing. The proof is not yet complete because we need to show the right invariance of the metric, but that I already worked out on the board. So the, that slide I'm going to skip in a moment. Okay. So now, suppose G is a non-group. Okay, uh, the non-trivial implication then, so modulo the right invariance, which I've already proved for you. So now the, what is the new? So uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, you showed three implies two, right? Can you show that slide where three? What is three? Can you just and show it again? The title of the slide: Two homogeneous length functions. Yeah. Homogeneous. Oh, okay. okay. I want to. I want to do okay, little okay. more. Of course, I want to say that a length function which is also homo, a length function which is two homogeneous is first of all homogeneous, and then as I worked out on the board, a length function which is homogeneous must also be right invariant or must be conjugation invariant, which was what we did if and only if. So yeah, so I'll be ah, okay. conjugate invariant. This is the part that says the note is not yet complete, but that was in the slides. I have not yet completed it. On the blackboard, I did it for you. Okay, fine. Good. Okay. So uh, yeah, this we have already worked out. Remember, I keep interchanging here between length functions and metrics because a length function is a left invariant metric. Okay. So now uh, the non-trivial implication then to prove is that G must be Abelian and torsion free. If I'm given that it is normed when the metric is left and right invariant, you can assume all that you want. Torsion free is immediate as I already showed you. This is a slightly different way of writing it, but whatever. So, okay, uh, let me skip these norms. This is the thing about this Milner business. Anyway, so uh, yeah, there's that, some technical things and uh, yeah, uh, let me skip that. But, uh, what what we sort of said is non-abelian D groups cannot be normed. That's the result that Milner had proved. What about the on the other hand, monoids can always be normed, free monoids. So what about general groups? This was open again, not to date, but open uh, until this problem got solved in 2017 December or 2018 January. Okay, so now here are some. So this is where I sort of met with. Uh, as I said, I had gone to UCLA for a different reason, uh, to, for a different collaboration of ours, but. Somehow this problem interested Tao so much that I said, well, fine. If you want to talk about this, we will talk about this problem. So we didn't talk about anything in the collaboration. We talked about this. And these are some of the conclusions we reached. First of all, I want to ask, remember what the problem is. Is there a non-abelian group with a norm? And a translation invariant metric and so on. So if there is such a group, suppose such a group exists, that means, first of all, the group is non-abelian. Right? That means there are two elements, alpha and beta, which do not commute. So if you look at the subgroup generated by those two, then that is also a non-abelian group because they don't commute. And it inherits the norm, the, the, this, the whatever, the homogeneous length function. It inherits that function from the bigger group to the smaller group, right? a metric subspace. So it's enough to look at a group generated by two letters which don't commute and ask if such a group admits a norm. The worst case, the case which is the most difficult, would be when you have no other relations to play with. So, you know, usually groups come with presentations, generators and relations. This is, these are the two generators. And suppose I have no relations to play with. I cannot use any extra information. Then can I prove that the group must be abelian? Or can I, uh, no, so if, if it is to be the case that the group is abelian, no such group exists, then I have to prove it in the most difficult case. And hopefully that will imply the proof in the easier cases. So the worst case, which is, uh, and since I told you that the answer is that no such group exists, we said, we felt that was the case, but we weren't sure. Tao didn't even have an intuition. I certainly had none. So we said, let us claim that such is the case. And if we want to prove that, then we have to prove it in the hardest case. Our proof has to work in the most difficult case where we have no extra information. And that is the case of a free group. So just to remind you, a free group on two letters, it's a very, very fundamental object in group theory and in geometry, geometry group theory. It is just a collection of strings in four letters, alpha, beta, and because it's a group, you have alpha inverse and beta inverse. And you multiply two strings by, so this is just a collection of all words or all strings in this, this alphabet. And so alpha, beta, alpha bars, so I will keep writing alpha bar for alpha inverse. Times alpha, beta is the concatenation. This, 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 this. 
But you see here, alpha bar and alpha definitely are known to be inverses. So really the only relations in this group with four generators is that alpha alpha inverse or alpha bar is equal to alpha bar alpha equal to one. And similarly for beta and beta bar. So if you multiply these five elements, you just get alpha beta square. And inverses again are like usual in a non-abelian group because this group is not abelian. You multi take the inverses and beta bar inverse is beta. So you get beta then alpha, then beta bar, and alpha bar. Okay, so I hope this is clear, the definition of a free group and uh, some multiplication and inverse. What is the identity element in a free group? Can anybody sort of say that in this language? Any guesses or any answers? The identity element in the free group. I told you inverse, I told you multiplication. I did not tell you the identity. Empty string. That's right. So the identity element is precisely the string with no letters. Or if you want, you can write alpha times alpha bar or alpha bar times alpha. But yeah, the empty string or the, the string that any string that cancels to give you the empty string. Right? So that's what the uh, sorry, oops, that is what the identity is. So the main theorem then, the three implies to the non-trivial part is to prove that there is no norm on F2. Sorry, two implies one. If it's a if it has a metric and a norm, translation invariant metric which is a scaling in way and it's a norm, then the group is abelian and torsion free. Torsion free is easy, so just the fact that it's abelian. And so, yeah, so we have to prove that our group has to go through for F2. What we discussed then is we sort of said that maybe the correct approach would be to prove that any such norm, if it exists, must satisfy that the norm of a commutator must be zero. Because remember, if the norm of a commutator is zero, then the commutator must be one, because it's a norm, it's a distance function. If the commutator is one, then alpha and beta commute. And therefore, you get a contradiction. So that was the hook. Of course, you know, that's the hope. Trying to prove it turned out to be an entirely non-trivial kettle of fish. More generally, we could ask if the same question holds for a pseudo-norm where you don't impose the strict positivity criteria and so on. But that is getting more technical. OK, so so as I said, so, so let's translate this in the language of uh, this uh, length function. So suppose F2 is pseudo norm or has a homogeneous pseudo length function like this satisfying length of GH is less equals length G plus length H. The, the reason why we are saying pseudo length means we are not going to use the fact that length is positive unless uh, G equal to one. We will not even need that. So it's even stronger. So the theorem that we prove in our paper is even stronger than the one I stated. I don't need to use right invariant. I don't need to use length equals positive number for g not equal to 1 and I don't need to use length of g equals length of g inverse. None of that is needed. Okay? And yet we can work. And we can do even more general, but I will say that at the end of the talk. Maybe. Let's see. Aha, okay. I will really need a few more minutes here. Sure. So can we prove that the length of alpha beta is 0? And the strategy is to try to prove that this length of alpha beta commutator is less than length of alpha times something plus length of beta times something plus something and so on for successively smaller values, uh, ci, okay? Uh, okay, so uh, the point is, if I can make all these values, which are non-negative, keep going down to zero, then that would be great. Then I finally get that it is less than a bunch of smaller and smaller positive numbers, and therefore I'm done. So first of all, here is one obvious thing. By the triangle inequality or the subadditivity, this is less than length of alpha plus length of beta plus length of alpha bar plus length of beta bar, right? Because this word itself is a product. That means I can use one plus one plus one plus one. So I get a sum of four. I want to go down from four to zero, remember. It's going to get more and more challenging as I will show you. More generally, I can remove this effect of the length alpha, beta and so on. Let me take the maximum of them to be less equals one. How? I can just divide this length function by the max of these guys and make sure that the max is less equals 1. So then I just need to ask whether this is bounded above by C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C4 because all of these are less than 1. How small can the summation be? And so as we saw, one example is that the summation is equal to 4. Can I keep going down to 0? So now here is where I use the conjugation invariance or the right invariance of the of the metric or the length function. So here is a nice way. I can go down from 4 to 2 immediately. Why? Because the length of alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar is less than the length of alpha 
plus the length of the rest. But you see, this guy is a conjugate, beta alpha inverse, beta inverse. The length of a conjugate, that's what right invariance was. The right invariance was saying G inverse BA uh, or something. Right? G inverse B inverse AG equals length of B inverse A. You can remove the two G inverse and G. That's what I do here. I remove the beta and beta bar. And so I get length of alpha plus length of alpha bar. And each of these is less than two. So I get from four to two. So that is how I come down from four to two. Now I claim that four over three, I can go down from two to four over three, even, even more uh, degrees. Why? So this is not guessable. So let me tell you, the idea is you want to prove that length of this is less than four over three. Clear the denominators. Then it means length of this times three is less than four. Right? But what is three times the length of any element of a you know, three times the length if the length is a norm function? It is length of this element cube. So I want to prove that the length of the cube is less than four. And that is what you do. You say the length of this thing is less equals one third of the length of the cube. But now remember, what is the commutator? It is alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar. That has four elements. So the cube has 12 elements. And I write that string of 12 letters, break it up into three. So I get alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar. So alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar. Then alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar. And then again, the same thing, but broken into groups of three. And you see, each of these guys is a conjugate. Therefore, you can use the conjugation invariant. So this is less than the length of alpha, beta, alpha bar, which is length of beta plus the length of the second term, which is the length of alpha, plus the third term, plus the fourth term. And again, each of these is less than one. Therefore, the total is less than four thirds. OK, so that's that's the reason why this works. But you see, it's getting trickier, right? So the first one was just length of subarrativity. So one plus one plus one plus one. The second is to break it up cleverly at one point here. And now we are breaking it up. We are taking a high power and breaking it up at four points. And still, you have only gotten from 4 over 1 to 4 over 2 to 4 over 3. Can you do better? Can you do 4 over n? Or can you at least, can you, this is still a finite improvement to a finite positive number. Can you come down? Can you keep doing better and better tricks? And so these were the kinds of word games that were that, that are the need of the hour, if you will. But it is completely unclear how to do that. And so that's where Tao and I stopped. Uh, discussing and then I said, okay, I have to, you know, I, that was actually on the second last day to my uh, flight back to India. So I said, I have to take my flight back and I went to the airport, I went to the hotel that is, and then that night I got an email from Tao saying, can I put it on my blog? Because I can't think of anything more, so let's put it on the blog. Maybe some other people can think of cleverer tricks. I said, sure, go ahead. And then I, uh, I left, I took the flight to India and Tao put it on his blog. Yeah, so here is a curious question posed to me by Apurva that I don't know the answer to. And then he explains the problem. This triangle, this is the prop triangle inequality and so on. The conjugation invariance, that's the right invariance of the metric. Uh, this is the triangle inequality. This is the norm condition. And he asked it again just for the free group because again, you know, if we can solve it for the free group, the hope was we can do it for everything. And then there is, I skip a bunch of the exposition on the blog. And then he says, what is not clear to me is if one can keep arguing like this to continually improve that upper bound. And that is the question I said here. Can we keep improving this thing to go down to zero? Anyway, this feels like a problem that might be more receptive to a crowdsourced attack. So I'm posing it here if readers want to try to make progress. And so now I'm going to start telling you about, uh, simultaneously, I will tell you about the story of the problem and the progress and the timeline. So uh, this is, so I think all times are in India standard time. So yeah, so at, at, he posted it on the 16th of December. So you see at, uh, it doesn't show the time anyway, uh, but the, that was the 17th December morning in India. And so he posted the three, the three progresses that I told you about, four, two and four, seven. Within three hours, Somebody in Germany, there is an extremely sharp uh, postdoc there, Tobias Fritz, he showed the proof that I told you on the board. Why the norm property and left invariance implies right invariance. Okay. And that's the proof that I already told you. This, this length of G inverse G is G inverse, less than length of H. And now by symmetry, you can do the conjugation. So yeah, this part I already told you. So that was in the in the first three hours, okay. 
So he said that you don't even need to assume that it is right invariant, you can derive it. Then I told you some clever constructions about this writing the third power of the commutator and breaking it up into groups of three. Well, people then started doing more and more clever constructions to 5 over 4, 19 over 16. But you see already the, the increments get smaller and smaller. Right? This was an increment of 2. This is an increment of 2 thirds. This is an increment of 1 twelfth. This is an increment of 1, I don't even know, 1 over 16. And this is, yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, uh, so we did it like multiply and divide by 3, right? Yeah. We could do it more uh, larger numbers like 6 and all. Would that, would that work? Uh, some of those work, some of them it's not clear. That's how, I guess, maybe somebody did 22 over 23. But it goes in steps. It doesn't go directly. You know, you have to do something, get some, uh, get an intermediate conclusion, then get a different intermediate conclusion. Now combine those and get a next conclusion, that kind of thing. It's not just one argument to have a large number of powers and just break it up at places. That does not work. Oh. Okay, yeah, that does not work. Uh, okay. But you see that, yeah, and even at this point, uh, like people sort of almost gave up. Like <laughs> 22 over 23 itself was very, very hard to get to. And the people were trying around the world. Therefore, the progress was happening around the clock. And I was jet lagged, which is why I was able to follow all of this progress. I've subscribed to Tao's blog. So every time a new email would come in my inbox, I would get a beep. And I would look and usually most of the emails, especially at night in India, were from Tao's blog. So people are trying and trying and, you know, it's, the tricks got more and more clever, more and more difficult. And at some point, I think around this time, we stopped. Like we could not, we did not know how to proceed further. And this is where a program, a computer program by my colleague right here, uh, contributed to the next idea. And the idea was very, he had his idea was somehow that if the length of alpha beta commutator is supposed to be close to zero, you want to show it is less than small positive numbers. Then by the triangle inequality, the length of this expression should be k times the length of some number close to zero times or plus the length of alpha. And so it should be close to length of alpha and therefore less equals one or at the most very close to being less equals one for very, very large k also. With this in mind, he programmed his computer to try and understand this. And the remarkable thing about computers these days is they can do it. So he, luckily for us, he knew how to program a computer. He did it. And this is his blog. So you see, so this happened on 17 December. And now this at 1 p.m. Uh, the next breakthrough was at uh, 20, almost three days later. And the reason why it was three days later is because after 17 December, at this point, Somehow people started going the other way. They said, no, let us try to construct a non-abelian group. Now we know that's the wrong approach because they don't exist. But for 48 hours out of the one week, out of the five days, the 48 hours in there got spent or I won't say wasted, I think it's just say spent in proving that non-abelian group, trying to come up with examples. And it took them two days to start. Luckily, what happened is in the examples, Tau put up his nilpotent uh, of order two calculation. And so even there, the strategy or the findings went and saying, okay, nilpotent groups of order two don't work. Okay, nilpotent groups don't work. Okay, solvable groups don't work. Lamplighter groups don't work. Lee groups don't work. So uh, in the search to find examples that work, all the results that kept coming through were that this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. <laughs> and so eventually, I think after 48 hours of negative results, people got convinced, okay, maybe it really doesn't work. Let's try to go back to this strategy and try to go from 22 over 23 to zero. So Siddharth actually was leading the search or well, was contributing to the search of finding examples that work and simultaneously trying to prove that it doesn't work. He was somehow able to parallel process his mind to try it in both ways. So he launched this computer program and it kept working in the background and trying to do things. Then he made it learn from previous iterations of the program. But finally, three days later, he had an answer. So from 22 over 23, that happened on the 20th. So, sorry, I should say the following. Right? So 19 over 16 maybe happened on uh, even 17th of December. Then people tried to answer something, whether it works or not, find examples. They couldn't. So then they went on trying to do this. And this happened on 20th December in the morning. Somebody came up with an obscenely clever, incredibly hard trick to come up with this number. But then for 24 hours, nobody else came up with anything in the world on that blog. And, but in the meantime, Siddharth was programming his computer and almost 22 hours later, 
it came up with this bound. And here is this proof. Look at the right hand column. So okay, let me look at the first entry here. One can get a bound on the commutator with a brutal proof by computer. And this can be found here. It's publicly accessible. And someone cleverer may extract useful inequalities as well. So Siddharth's proof goes, and he made the computer write it in the format that human beings can read. So the norm of alpha bar is less than one. Therefore, the norm of beta bar is less than one using the conjugation invariance. The norm of beta bar is less than one. Therefore, the norm of alpha bar is less than one. Sorry, alpha beta bar, alpha bar is less than one using conjugation invariance. And so you see, he is writing the proof down as an undergraduate, as we understand what a proof is. A proof is a finite sequence of statements, each of which follows from the previously proved things and the axioms using the laws that are allowed to us. So in that format, he proved it. And if you look at the 125th step, uh, that is A, B, A bar, B bar, A, B, A bar, B bar, and so on. It's a huge string of 17 of those occurrences, less than 13.8, using the previous step. Therefore, taking the 17th roots, you get that alpha, beta, the 17th property, the norm property, the norm of a commutator is less than 0.815. So that is the proof. And it is, you know, 126 steps. So it is incredibly difficult. Human beings could not have come up with it. Luckily, the computer did. So it's as much, I believe, still a credit to the programmer who programmed the computer. But anyway, uh, the point was, this was written at 8 p.m. in whatever time zone. And a hundred, exactly 100 minutes later, in an hour and a half, somebody actually read through this proof, understood it, and told us how to improve it. This was beautiful. My intuition was, blah, blah, blah. I was surprised that when reading your file, the computer has done the same thing. The first 43 lines, he decoded to mean this is what it gets. The next 44 lines give you this. So you see, as I said, this is not a direct calculation of writing down a large multiple and then getting something. You establish milestones along the way. And use this, by the way, gives a new bound of 5 over 9 uh, okay, for some other reason. And then the last few things establish all of this using this to get the bound to be 0.816. This was very well done. And now here is how to improve it. And he kept going. So there are some remarkably clever people who can read these things in real time and understand what these are and improve the bounds. Anyway, so all that eventually was happening on Tau's blog. So people said, okay, how do we actually make sense of this? Can we formalize this argument? And then Terence Tau, uh, in his usual bread and butter style, said, okay, let me understand all of this and condense it to the simplest possible way to write it. And this is the way he wrote it down. Suppose I have four elements in any group with a homogeneous length function such that x is conjugate to wy and to z times w inverse. Then the length of x is bounded above by a sum of, by the average of these two things. Okay. And the remarkable thing is the right hand side does not depend on w. x is conjugate to wy, x is conjugate to z w inverse, but the right hand side doesn't have w. Okay. So why is this true? And the proof is actually explainable over here. This is the end of the proof. The proof is simple. But the proof is simple after the computer did all this work and somebody decoded it and then it was further discussed and now we understand what is the key, the heart of that proof and the heart of the rest of the proof here. Suppose, and then this lemma again has nothing to do with being abelian or not or anything. This is just four elements in, a, in a, any group with a homogeneous length invariant function. Okay? So suppose x is equal to s w y s inverse and x is also equal to t times z w inverse t inverse conjugates. Do the same thing that I told you on the blackboard earlier. Look at the two nth power this time of x. The first n powers I write down is the n powers of this conjugate and the last n powers of that conjugate. So I get s wy to the n s inverse t zw inverse to the n t inverse. Okay. And now forget this inequality. Just look at this expression. I'm writing it down here. s wy 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 s inverse t Z W bar, Z W bar, Z W bar, Z W bar, T inverse, T bar. The length of this function, this big word, is less than the length of S, the length of T bar, and the length of everything in between. Okay? That's clear, right? It's just the triangle, in, the uh, subadditivity, the triangle in the point. But you see, the length of everything in between, the everything in between is a conjugate. W and W inverse. The conjugation invariance, I can remove the outer arc. So I get length of S plus length of T bar plus length of the word in between removing the outer terms. So I can again take out the length of Y, length of Z, 
and then I get another thing in between, but that is a conjugate. So the length of that, I can remove the outermost terms again. Then again, I get length of y, length of z, and again something in between, which is again a conjugate. I can remove the outer terms and I keep going. And at the end, I would get some w and w inverse here, and I get a length of s bar, length of t. And that is why this length of this big thing is less than the length of s, length of s inverse, length of t, length of t inverse, and n of the y's, n of the z's, and none of the w's. Okay. So that is the that is the key calculation. And now you know what to do, right? Now this is this extremely powerful trick. So one doesn't appreciate the Archimedean principle of the real line until one learns something like this. Now what do you do? Well, divide both sides by 2n. So this is 2n times the length of x. Divide, you get the length of x. Less than n over 2n is this over 2, exactly the right-hand side, plus all of this number divided by 2n. But now take n to infinity. I don't care what this number is because it's divided by 2n. This term vanishes and you get the conclusion. So to prove that something is less equal to something else, it's enough to prove this is less than that right hand side plus something over 2n for every n. And that is the Archimedean property of the real line that is used. So you have to use just fundamental things like that. The Archimedean property, the property of homogeneity, the property of the triangle inequality, and this very, very clever thing about putting in conjugates all throughout this thing. There are so many conjugates in this. And that is the clever trick. And as I said, so the tricks are very clever, but the mathematics is extremely basic. There is nothing we can use because it's over an arbitrary group. Okay, so now the point is it turns out that using this, I'm going to show you a sample application and then I will skip the slide, the next slide. Okay, so here is a specialization. So specialized to this string, alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar, commutator times again the commutator times alpha, a nine element string. Define that is x. Define y to be a conjugate of these two conjugates and z to be a conjugate of these two conjugates and w to be beta. You can check then that x is conjugate to w, y and to z, w inverse. So this is x, y, w, and z. And you can check that these elements satisfy the previous lemma. Therefore, the length of x is less than half the length of y and z. By the lemma, what is the length of x? Length of x is length of this commutator square alpha times half the length of y plus half the length of Well, what is length of y? y is a conjugate. So the length of y is at most the length of the inside. But the inside is a product of two conjugates. So the length of y is less most the length of alpha plus the length of beta bar, which is just 1 plus 1. So length of y is at most 2. Similarly, the length of z is at most 2. Right? It's a conjugate. So you can remove the conjugate for calculating lengths. It's a product of these two things. So the length is less than length of this plus length of this. Each of those is a conjugate. So you see how I keep using these nested conjugations. And this is completely crazy. You can't think of this in general. But this was thought of by somebody on the blog after Tau stated this lemma and proved it. And so you see that the length of x, whatever this x is, is less than 2. 2 plus 2 over 2. But now I claim that 8 over 11 works. So I'm just showing you one application in two or three steps of this internal repetition trick from the previous slide. I claim that 8 over 11 is an upper bound for my constant. And what was the constant earlier? The constant earlier was 0.816, right? This is bigger than 8 over 10. So 8 over 11 beats it. I'm giving you a constant that blows away all of these previous constants out of the water using nothing other than this one lemma. That is the power of this lemma. And why does 8 over 11 work? It's enough to show that 11 times the length of the commutator is less than 8. Well, so write down 11 times the length of the commutator is the length of <coughs> 11 powers of the commutator. 11 powers means that there are 44 elements in the string. I break up the 44 elements into products of four products of 11 each. So it is less than the length of this element plus the length of this element plus the length of this element plus the length of this element. Well, what is the first element? The length of the first element, the first element is a conjugate. So I can remove that. And what I get inside is beta alpha bar square, beta alpha, beta alpha bar, this thing, square times beta. Similarly, for all the other three expressions, I get in each case length of a commutator square times the first element. But every one of those I just calculated above to be less than two. 
Therefore, it's 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, which is 8. So you see, you have to come up with incredibly crazy, clever things to do. And even the internal repetition trick was clever, but that alone was not enough. Then you have to figure out these four specific elements, get this relation, and then write down 11 times this. So, you know, the, the tricks can get way complicated. And it is not clear at all how to now beat 8 over 11. Yes, I in the last slide and this slide, I showed you how to get 8 over 11 using very clever tricks. And this is 0.72. So you come down, really come down you know, from 0 0.816 to 0 0.72. But even still, this is, it beats the previous best bound, but it is still not nowhere close to zero. And I mean, a positive number is a positive number. There still is a lot of gap between that and zero. How to keep going lower? Okay. So it turns out that they are enough to prove the theorem. Uh, I am not going to prove the theorem for you, but uh, that is getting way more complicated. It's very technical. But you can do this. The trick, the clever trick to realize at the end is how do you prove it? You have to show that the length of alpha beta to the n is n times the length of alpha beta commutator. You want to show that that is zero. Well, you have to show that it is growing slower than linearly. And the way to prove it is to prove it using somehow a binomial random variable, which is whose variance is linear. So the key is that the variance should be slower than quadratic. And for a binomial random variable, the variance is linear. <clears throat> that is just the weak law of large numbers, if you will, in other words. But so therefore, the standard deviation, which is what we care about, is slower than linear. It is a square root. So what you get is n times the length of alpha beta in a free group or in any group where you have non-commuting elements, or take any two elements, rather. You would see that the length of alpha beta to the n is n times the length of alpha beta is less than the constant times the square root of n. Divide by n, so you get length of alpha beta is less than a some a root 2 divided by root n. Take n goes to infinity, and therefore you get 0. And so uh, alpha beta must be 1. Therefore, the commutator equals 1, so alpha and beta commute. For all choices of alpha and beta in the group with a homogeneous length function or a bi-invariant translation invariant norm, therefore g is abelian. So it uses a bunch of very, very clever arguments. And then the arguments here, even in this part, can be stated very, very uh, simply. But you have to use this trick that the variance of a binomial random variable is slower than quadratic, or the standard deviation is slower than linear. But even that is not too hard to prove. That is something very standard in pro basic probability theory. So only using basic tools, and then at the end, this uh, weak law of large numbers, if you will, for binomial, one gets this result. And therefore, finally, that is the end of the proof. Uh, that proves that uh, every group with a norm has to be abelian. OK, and now the point is one can then do some kind of additivity errors and so on. But uh, I just want to show you this slide that there are. Uh, so we wrote this paper under the common name of DHJ polymaths because the tradition apparently in mathematics is, again, a very 21st century tradition and uh, author polymath is to uh, write these names with not individual names are not written in the paper. They are written as pre j polymaths. Anyway, so but you can, so you see the above result does not require, you can extend the main theorem of our paper to this one. And here we don't use the fact that uh, length is, uh, length of one is zero, length of g is length of g inverse. Uh, we does not require length to be zero infinity valued, to be non-negative valued and so on. So and that leads to some quantitative applications in geometric group theory of which I'm, again, not an expert, so I will refer you to the paper for details. OK, so I guess I'm sort of done. But in the last few minutes, let me just remind you of the Polymaths project timeline. So this was the first blog uh, that Tao posted up. And uh, so all times are in Indian Standard Time. Uh, in three hours, uh, Tobias Fritz from Germany, he had, I guess, just woken up early morning and uh, in Germany time. And he proved that the non-property and left invariance implies right invariance. And then, uh, so then this is where, as I said, immediately people first started to try to come up with examples uh, to prove it. OK, I forgot the timeline myself, but now I remember it. To come up with examples that work. So and in coming up with trying to come up with examples, they proved that this doesn't work. In two hours, uh, Terence Tau came up with that example of the commutator argument. GH to the n square is the commutator of GH to, G to the n and H to the n. That proved inside two hours from Tobias's observation 
that norms don't exist for non-obedient nilpotent groups. Uh, then people, I think, people in America went off to bed. It was already 3 a.m. So then they woke up, and then I think that's where the proof got proved that this doesn't exist for lamplighter groups, therefore for non-obedient solvable groups. And then, uh, yeah, and then there was no progress because they tried to come up with more examples that work, and finally they gave up. So then they said, let us come back to improving this upper bound to zero. So from 4 over 3 to 5 over 4. In the next 69 minutes, it went from 5 over 4 to 19 over 16. So then this was a matter of minutes, you see, not even hours. Uh, more attempts to get the sum to go below 1. Uh, then finally, uh, 7, it took a few hours, uh, but it kept going, kept going, kept going below. Finally, the breakthrough to below 1 was achieved at 11, 12 a.m. and 20th of December. And this is when Tao put up, he said, okay, let me now, okay, we have reached below 1. That is, seems to be a milestone, significant enough that I will now collect all the known arguments and put them up you know, in a clean form, establish all that is known, all the techniques that you can use. And he put up a second blog post. Yeah, but at that point, because the bound was below 1, various people thought that it should go down to 0. But, okay, how do you even make the next progress? And this was the 24-hour barrier that Siddhartha and his computer broke through. This slide I showed you earlier. This was at 9.30 a.m. on the 21st. Uh, and then Pace Nielsen understood it, uh, how to improve it. Within four hours, it went down to that slide that I showed you. So that slide got created, devised to 8 over 11 in the next four hours after that. Uh, <clears throat> in the next five hours, it went down to 2 over 3. <laughs> so it kept making progress. But again, at every point, I should emphasize, 2 over 3 is still very far from 0. Any positive number, epsilon, is very far from zero. You have to do, these are all finite step improvements. You want, you want a routine that will work infinitely. And that happened again by the same person who made the first contribution, Tobias Fritz. He said, let us write down something like this, the length of alpha to the m, alpha beta to the k, and find a discrete heat equation kind of an analog. And he did. And already by this time, again, enough progress it felt was being made. This was just below 1, already 2 over 3 was there, some improvements may have been there beyond that. So Tao created no longer a blog, but a Wikipedia page for polymath. <clears throat> and I should point out that in English, polymath means very differently what me than what mathematics polymath means. So this is Tao's polymath page. This is the wiki page for understanding semi-norms of linear growth. So this is this condition and this condition. See, we don't even care about the, this, the norm of 1 being 0. This should be enough to prove it. And we use the usual group theory notations, blah, blah, blah. And you see, by the end of the day, there were four, uh, four uh, blog posts by Tao, not just the first two, but he posted two more. So you see, he posted this at 22nd December at 1.47 a.m. This is 21st December in America. And this one is already on the same day, the solution. So it was found sort of, so this is at 1.47 a.m. in India time, two hours and 10 minutes later, Tao finished the proof. So, the, so you see here is at 12, 11 p.m. At 12, 17 p.m. He said, I'm starting work on the Wikipedia page to collect and organize all these estimates. This is at 12, 17 and two hours and 10 minutes later, I think this does indeed work to uh, kill the problem and finish the problem. And that time he used something called churn of bounds and probability. But then this was cleaned up very, very much to only use binomial random variables and the fact that the variance grows slower than quadratic. So once you really understand the problem, then this becomes much, uh, you can really understand what is at the essence. And that was the thing that I said at the start of the problem. We want to work with primitive settings. We wanted to see what is the minimum information and minimum thing needed to prove such a result. And the minimum that is needed is if the group has to be abelian and torsion free, sorry, the group has to have a left invariant homogeneous metric or a homogeneous length function in other words. Yeah, so this then became the paper. Then we started writing the paper in the manner for formal mathematics paper. But again, this paper is completely understandable from start to finish because we cannot use anything sophisticated in it. This was finally uploaded on January uh, 11th. Tao again blogged. That was his fourth and last blog about the project. And it showed up on the Polymath blog. There's a blog of Polymath projects where uh, it's called the Spontaneous Polymath Pro Problem 14, a success. This is now called Polymath 14 that took place over Terry Tao's blog. A problem posed by Apurva was presented and discussed and openly and collectively solved. And then the paper got archived and then published as well. These are some of the existing Polymath projects until that point. 
And so this was the last point. So, uh, yeah. And you see, not all the polymath problems have been solved. For example, even uh, polymath 12 and 13 are proposed, but not solved. See, polymath classified this thing, results submitted January 11th. So this was one of the few successes. Some of them were concluded without success and so on. But uh, yeah, okay, so that's, that's that. And so if there are, you see, 14 polymath problems, but only seven papers. And even out of the seven papers, two or three of them are about the first polymath problem. So it's not one of the famous polymath problems is about the twin primes conjecture and Zan type this thing. That is one of them. So you see, versions two and four talk about the same problem. One is an informal perspective, newsletter. One is a paper of 107 pages. Then uh, this one is a separate problem. Versions, uh, sorry, yeah, two, three, and four talk about the same thing. Six and seven talk about the very first polymath problem in 2009, 2010. There's a four year gap here. And then there's a four year gap here. So very, very few actually made it to completion. I'm glad to report that this was one of them. Of course, this was a very fundamental characterization of abelian groups, but a very, very basic question, but it took some ingenuity to solve it. And uh, so yeah, finally, these are the references. Uh, this is the paper that was finally published. This is the paper from which, you know, these are the two papers in probability that motivated the question itself. So yeah, sorry I took up almost one o'clock. So, but uh, yeah, thank you for thank you for your time and attention.